If you go to page 104 in the Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook, you'll find the Wild Magic Surge Table, a list of 50 random spells and effects. If a sorcerer following the Wild Magic Path rolls a 1 while casting a spell, instead of critically failing, they roll a d100 and cast the correlating random effect from this list. To summarize, if Silly Magic Man messes up, then his Wild Magic is going to go AWOL. He could turn himself into a sheep, grease up his entire party, maybe all of his hair falls out. Sounds like my bachelor party. This is the sort of randomness that I need in my life, but I asked myself, why is this chart only exclusive to sorcerers? What if other classes had this wild magic? If anything, wild magic seems more like a character trait than a class archetype. So if it were in other classes, how would this wild magic manifest itself? Perhaps they owned a cursed weapon, spellbook, tome, tattoo, or even an instrument that when they critically failed while using it would cause wild magic to erupt around them. Perhaps the deity they get their magic from is spiteful or a trickster, or maybe they're just bad at their job. It only comes out when they're in a rage or using key points during a full moon, smoke and crack. Wild magic is this pure, unrefined chaos of the universe. And every character, whether it's core to them as a person or just for a one night bender, should be able to tap into it. So I made a wild magic surge table for every single class, or at least the 11 other standard classes. Still, that's over 500 random effects that had to come out of my flabby little brain fold. You can tell by some of these entries that um, it really did break me as a person. First up are barbarians, and according to the book, they're defined by their rage, but we know that they're more complex than just that. They live for the action, they laugh in the face of danger, and they love the group with a great sense of loyalty. Live, laugh, love. These are the three mantras of any basic interior designer, and for that reason, the barbarian is HGTV's property brothers. Jonathan, Drew, Please don't take any offense by this, you know I still love you both. With their low emotional IQ, a raging barbarian might run into a spider cave, swing their axe, roll a one, it flies out of their hands, and that wild magic explodes out of them in the form of hot steam exiting from all of their orifices. Like the video if you don't want hot steam to come out of your orifices. And if you want that to happen, good on you. How about your weapons become double-sided? A double-sided warhammer, trident, crossbow. For the next few hours, you pee delicious ale. Once this happens in a campaign, new friendships are going to be formed. New kinks discovered. Give a raging barbarian battle axe hands, rocket boots, or just make them poop themselves. They're bound to embrace the chaos. Bards, they're the storytellers, instrumentalists, vocalists, and usually the character that's on thin ice with the rest of the group. Do they contribute anything to the team? Like, what does the class even do? Exactly. They're the younger sibling that you have to bring with you. They're a nuisance most of the time, but mom gave them $10, and you can use that money to buy yourself Pokemon packs. Plus, who knows, at the end of the day, they could end up wishing you back to life, and that's pretty useful. All of your weapons and equipment become tiny for one minute. And I mean everything becomes tiny. Cast True Polymorph on a creature and turn them into an instrument of your choice that you can then play or also talk to them. I want to turn a goblin into a flute, uh, a ghoul into a pair of bongos, and my neighbor's cat into a banjo. How about a cloud that follows you around and rains hot dogs? Here's the thing, bards are such a unique class and you can go a bunch of different directions with it, so definitely customize your own chart to fit your character. I think bards are one of the best classes for wild magic. Clerics. You got healing, good versus evil, divine domains. A cleric's magic comes from the relationship between themselves and their deity. And for this reason, clerics are the cool pasture at your church. They know some guitar chords. You've seen them wearing jeans before. And they talk to your dad about IPAs. Your mom hits a deer in front of the church, and the pastor comes out, and he puts his hand onto the frightened beast, and you see white light starting to transfer into the creature, right as the gift of life is about to enter the creature's eyes. Instead, blood rains down from the sky, covering everyone and the minivan. Use divine intervention for free. You get to summon your deity. You know, they get to hang out with you. It's kind of like your dad finally makes it to one of your baseball games, except instead of your dad, it's a god, and instead of a baseball game, you're fighting a vampire or something. 
Plus, you can also ask your dad to storm the mound and help you kill the other team. Summon a squirrel at your feet. If within range next turn, cast harm onto it. I'll be honest, I have a few that are similar to this one, just meant to cause unnecessary trauma. I think this one's not even cleric related, it just says more about me. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes my sociopath shows through, whatever. <laughs> I don't care. I'm just kind of weird, quirky, don't have emotions, I don't know. I love using wild magic to cast the higher level spells that you usually don't see uh, with certain parameters. A favorite of mine is definitely Hero's Feast. I mean, I don't know who's going to use a six level spell slot uh, to summon a bunch of food. I especially don't know anyone that's going to cast this during a battle. Wild magic is the perfect excuse to summon a whole bunch of food in the middle of the action and possibly cause a food fight. Druids. They're all about nature, elements, animals. They're kind of like a mix between modern day hippies and hunters. I could see a druid waking up from their yurt, green smoothie in hand, cleaning up after yesterday's drum circle, and then getting in the 4x4 and going duck hunting with the boys. Druids don't really like unnatural magic, and they could perceive their wild magic as making them more distant from the natural that they so desire. Also, a bird might poop on them. Some wild weather effects could happen, like casting an ice storm on yourself or a gust of wind blowing off everybody's clothes and armor. Animalistic transformations, like growing a bunch of legs and gaining spider abilities, or growing a monkey's tail. What does that mean in D&D? I don't know. Maybe you can swing a sword with your tail now. Transform into a centaur, grow fruit from your head, force an enemy to follow a vegan diet. I mean, how cool would it be to like make the main vampire boss vegan for a couple days? Druids won't eat anything with palm oil in it, and they'll simultaneously strangle a squirrel for breakfast. So what happens if you summon a giant shark in front of them? Who knows? Fighters are said to be empty shell of classes, and that's true. But in the guidebook it says, fighters learn the basics of all combat styles. So essentially the guy standing around at the party whose go-to conversation starter is that he bought a sword last week. For the next minute, each time you deal damage with a weapon, an equal amount of coin drops from the opponent's wounds. This is a great one. The character will be slashing up people, and the other party members will be grabbing those coins like it's candy from a pinata. Your kicks deal extra damage, and they send objects flying 30 feet into the air. Your head has the stats of a battering ram. If you consume a creature's heart within the next five minutes, you can gain one of its abilities. Okay. There's also just really stupid ones, like your weapon gets another weapon at its point. So imagine like a pike with another pike at the end, or a morning star with a pike at the end. There's bound to be some ridiculous weapon combos. Good luck to DMs figuring that one out. An old man watches you from a distance. He doesn't let you approach him, and he only goes away after watching you take a long rest. This is my greatest work. With fighters, having such a blank canvas was actually really useful. It's mainly just physical acts with magical qualities woven in. I think it would be really interesting if there was a fighter that had wild magic within them and they didn't even realize it. Like they're just fighting a boss and all of a sudden a glass of milk shows up and they just kind of accept it and move on. Monks, they have washboard abs, meditation in their morning routine, and they try to sell you some weird powder that's supposed to enhance your key. They're definitely the Instagram fitness models of the D&D world. Key is actually just the embodiment of magic within oneself. And most monks discover their inner key by finding a P90X DVD as a baby. And now they can do cool backflips and shit. Of all the monks I've played with when faced with adversity, when the server brings them a coconut instead of lemon flavored LaCroix, they just try to punch their way out of any situation. And I kept that in mind when making this table. A tattoo of a creature of your choice forms on your body. That creature has disadvantage when hitting. I would just get a Zorn tramp stamp like the one I have in real life. You summon a smaller version of yourself and it begins attacking your allies. I had a similar nightmare, except I was just playing Barry in the live action remake of the B-movie. The monk's hands fall off and become their own hostile enemies. You gain 30 feet of digging speed. You turn into dust and then reappear somewhere else. You spend all of your key points and summon a bunch of cheese. Pushing a monk's body to their limits with this sort of key wild magic combo should result in some crazy feats. Or it could also end up killing off the character that's been kind of overpowered in your campaign. You never know what happens with wild magic, okay? Paladins are basically clerics with swords, but their relationship with their deity is a bit more, I'd say, dependent. And for that reason, paladins are teacher's pets. 
This role definitely has its benefits. You're able to cast magic, you have a place to eat at during lunch, but your unrelenting quest to follow your deity, Miss Milfred, doesn't make you super popular with the other classmates. But that's okay, Miss Milfred taught you how to send them to the Nine Hells. Maybe your holy symbol turns into a badass sword, or you give birth to a bunch of bug-like demons. Maybe your jaw unhinges like a snake. I don't know many paladins that would willingly accept wild magic, but if you just tell a paladin that it's what their deity wants, they'll basically do anything you say. Rangers, they're the hunters that protect civilization from the wild outskirts. They're definitely the person you're only friends with because they have a cute pet. Now, some rangers don't get animal companions. They choose to be good at a bow or something. And my chart is a mix of the two. It's got some animal stuff. It's got some projectile bow stuff. But if you're seriously going to make a ranger and not choose the pet one, your group is going to like you like 30% less. What if you were able to teach your animal companion how to use one of your weapons? I mean, a snake using a sword? How would it even use it? Is it wrapped around it? Is it telepathic? Good thing my neighbor's cat doesn't know how to use a weapon. Or on the negative side, maybe the wild magic gives your animal companion rabies and it starts to attack you. And as you're trying to cure it, you accidentally triple its size. Whether it's summoning an evil version of your animal companion, uh, laying an egg, or becoming the prime version of your father, rangers can hopefully, with this wild magic, gain some sort of personality and talk about anything else besides just monster hunting. Rogues. Sneaky. Sly. Sometimes a bit devious. They're the midnight snackers. You don't know who's been taking your bagel bites, but if their stealth wasn't so damn high, you'd probably conclude that it was the guy in the ninja outfit with marinara stains. Rogue's stealthiness is kind of overpowered, and that's what makes them fun. So if there's one thing that a rogue really hates, it's attention. So I put plenty of that in this chart. How about the rogue has to yell out everything on the person that they've stolen? even the stuff that they stole from the party. A shrieking creature is on top of their head for 24 hours, K-pop just starts emitting from their body. Of course, I also want some random events that make rogues even more stealthy, like turning them invisible or turning them into a shadow. How about one of your hands detach and flies away, and after an hour it comes back with a random item? Or a crow flies down and just drops 10 gold into your hand. Rogue's sly and secretive nature is the perfect platform for wild magic to either embrace the stealthiness or expose them. Speaking of exposing, what about an 8 by 10 feet masterfully crafted photorealistic painting of yourself in the nude falling from the sky into your hands? Just a thought. Warlocks, they gain their magic from a higher power, but not necessarily a deity and also not necessarily a good-natured thing. They're obsessed with obtaining magical power, and they weren't born with this power. They didn't go to some Ivy League school, didn't go to church. Nah, they were out smoking in the back. They're the bad boys of the group. They're the extreme couponers. Think about it, who else would make a deal with a demon lord just so that you could cast minor illusions? The same people that buy 100 bottles of mustard so that it costs only $6. That, my friend, is not a hobby, that is a way of life. And giving your soul to the devil requires the same amount of devotion. How about you summon some cult followers? Be sure to subscribe to join our cult. What if you summoned a bone devil that was under your control? Finally, a worthy opponent for my neighbor's cat. What about some negatives, though, like your arm turns black, shrivels up, and then falls off? or you explode into some green acid and a body has to drink that green acid in order for you to explode out of them and come back to life. This is some real extreme shit, okay? You banish the next person to speak, probably gonna be the bard. Your hair turns into centipedes, your skeleton leaves your body. Warlocks are putting themselves in grave danger by messing with this wild magic, much like your uncle who started making lamps. God damn it, Jeff, you don't know the first thing about electrical wiring. I understand you have a lot of antlers lying around, Jeff. Everyone at the table knows that when the warlock messes up, something terrifying is gonna happen. What's even more concerning is that the warlock is kind of into it. And last up are wizards. Where sorcerers are sort of the child prodigies, wizards had to work their ass off and get their doctorate degree just to learn how to cast a cantrip. And really, the only thing that wizards have is their magic, and that makes them a ham sandwich. I'll be honest, this is the last class on the list, and I couldn't really think of a good way to categorize wizards, but for whatever reason, this just feels right. So normally, the only things that wizards can really do is cast magic. So number one, let's make their magic even crazier, and number two, let's let them branch out, experience some other things that the game has to offer. How about this? Throw a minotaur at a creature of your choice. 
Yeah, this is way better than casting a firebolt for like the fifth time. How about you can cast wish, but you can only use one word? What are you gonna say? Kill? Eh, that could go poorly. You know what? I hope your DM likes you. That's all I'm gonna say. How about you accidentally send yourself into a maze that you have to escape? Or you transform yourself into a big fat blob? Summon some asteroids from the sky. Make yourself go dumb. Throw up a bunch of frogs. You gotta live a little, my torte de jamón. It's time to slap some sriracha between those buns, okay? Well, those are some of my favorite examples from each class. Uh, the full lists will be in the description if you want. I also made a list of over 200 entries that are uh, not class specific, let's call them neutral, that you could really use for any class. And definitely customize these charts to fit your character and make sure your DM goes over them so that nothing is game breaking. I mean, it's actually pretty fun when things are game breaking too. Y'all have a good one, okay? Thank you, bye.